Hello and welcome. I'm Mandy Clark and this is World is One, a show that brings together some of the greatest political minds. Global leaders share their ideas, discuss challenges, and present perspectives on some of the most pressing issues around the globe. Today we meet the man who is the first democratically elected leader of the Maldives, President Mohamed Nasheed. He's the first Maldivian politician to topple a dictator who ruled for 30 years and become the island state's first democratically elected president in 2008. He's also famous for holding a cabinet meeting on the floor of the Indian Ocean to draw attention to the rising seas that will swallow the 1192 islands that make up the Maldives in less than half a century. Mohammed Nasheed resigned four years later under mysterious circumstances. The former journalist and human rights activist of the Maldivian Democratic Party was jailed, but eventually took asylum in the United Kingdom, where he received the support of no less than the celebrity lawyer Amal Clooney to defend him against a controversial conviction. The current government in Malay under President Yamin is under fire for widespread corruption brutal censorship and allowing Islamist fundamentalism to flourish under the influence of Saudi Arabia. But Mohammed Nasheed has joined hands with swathes of the opposition, including his totalitarian predecessor Mamoun Gayoum, and is determined to return to the Maldives and reinstate democracy in this tolerant and idyllic country. Thank you, President Nasheed. Now, you were the first democratically elected leader of the Maldives in 2008, supported by a coalition that wanted to oust President Gayoum. Why did you get into politics? I think it was an accident of history. Um, I started my adult life as a journalist. Um, I liked writing. Uh, but every time I wrote, um, they arrested me. Uh, and so, therefore, I actually lost my 20s to jail. Uh, uh, an attempt to not being arrested, um, I thought um, it might work, would be to become an MP. I did become an MP, but they arrested me. Uh, but then these arrests kept on coming and going and coming and going, uh, and finally we left the Maldives and formed a political party in exile in Sri Lanka and then later on in England as well. Uh, through that, uh, uh, we were able to galvanize our people to political activism. Uh, we were able to amend the constitution and we had our first multi-party elections. Uh, so because I was involved in um, all of this, all, all throughout, from 1989 all the way up to, let's say, 2005, 6 um, I'd been working very hard on, especially, I was only writing, but uh, uh, to defend um, human rights, um, I worked hard on that and freedom of expression. And therefore, well, I was fortunate to have won that election in 2008. By 2012, you were forced to resign and later you had to go into exile. A lot of pro-democracy supporters felt abandoned. Why did you have to leave? Well, I was arrested soon after the coup. Uh, or rather, soon after the election. After the coup, uh, we went into another election, uh, 2013. Uh, that was rigged. Um, they cancelled the election. Every time I won, they kept on cancelling it, nullifying it, until it took them so many rounds of election until they won it. Um, and then uh, we decided to be a, a loyal opposition um, and remain as an opposition. Uh, but uh, about six, seven months into President Yamin's government, he decided to arrest me. Um, and then I was in prison for one year um, as a former president. Uh, and then I was able to uh, leave on medical grounds, um, but pri uh, through a lot of assistance from the international community, especially um, United Kingdom, the US and India and Sri Lanka. And I was able to leave and I came to England and sought a, um, a refuge here. Um, I will go back. Uh, I intend to go back. Uh, hopefully, um, I would be back in the Maldives soon. Yes, it's sad that I'm not there. I miss the Maldives a lot. 
Uh, but unfortunately, I have very little option. Now, President Gayoom ruled the country for 30 years with an iron fist. He's been accused of being a despot and accused of torture. And now you're joining forces with him to try and oust the current president. Aren't you going to lose a lot of support from your backers? I think there is a far greater need um, to get democracy back on track than uh, uh, me being popular. Um, I don't think that's the issue. I think the issue is that the country must come back on a more democratic track. Um, in my view, to do that, everyone must join hands uh, and we must try to find common ground. Um, and I'm very fortunate and, and we are very happy that we've been able to um, structure that coalition. Even though President Gayoom, for many uh, of your countrymen, wouldn't represent democracy. Uh, both President, all, all of us, President Gayoom, myself, um, all the other political leaders and the people of the Maldives, we've learned a lot in the last 15 years. Um, we've experienced um, probably what other countries have gone through in 50 years. Uh, we went through uh, that uh, in a period of about eight, nine years. And I think we've, we've all learned a lot. And, and we must see that the country is back on a proper democratic course. Uh, and to do that, uh, we must bring everyone together uh, and isolate the president. Um, again, um, I'm happy that we've been able to do that. Now, there are rumors out there that President Gayoom asked for a hundred thousand US dollars from you to show your honesty and integrity and commitment uh, to this and that you have paid half of that sum. What do you say to that? Well, you know, I think anyone who knows me would know, A, that I wouldn't have $50,000. Um, in my bank account right now, I have £6,000. Um, and for me, $50,000 is a lot of money. Uh, and I don't think President Gayoom or anyone actually in the Maldives would believe that. Uh, these are rumours, and I think uh, we must understand that they are actually rumours, and there's no facts whatsoever to that. Uh, it, it would be silly, wouldn't it? President Gayoom asking me for money. I, I don't think uh, uh, that would ever happen. No, it didn't happen. So who's benefiting from spreading these rumors? President Yamin. This is all coming from President Yamin. Well, yes, he has a um, uh, rumor-mongering mill uh, that he produces all these false allegations. And then he not only just simply have them as rumours, but then bring them up in, in courts uh, through Trump charges, um, and I would argue kangaroo courts, and then sentence people to jail with these rumours, with no facts whatsoever. Uh, and I, I'm afraid, um, even today as we speak, uh, one of the bigger businessmen, uh, Ghassim Ibrahim, he's been charged for uh, bribing uh, uh, MPs. Uh, again, what has happened is President Gayoom left the government and when he left, about 17 MPs crossed sides. Now, there, there was, th that's all what has happened. Uh, there are people who support President Gayoom and, and these people have left um, the government and crossed over to the opposition. Now, you've previously said that the vice president is a victim rather than an accomplice of the president to corruption and embezzlement. How is that so? Well, when I started knowing him, he was very young. He still is very young. He's still just about 32, I think. And he, was brought, he came into politics um, um, and then he was given a big job. And then he was given tasks. Uh, by the president. You, you, you would know um, from Al Jazeera um, documentary um, how President Yamin has tasked him to do all these things. Um, I'm not suggesting that he is he's innocent, but what I'm saying is we must look into all the connections uh, and at the bigger picture of what was happening. Um, so I think he's a victim. Well, in the documentary, there's certainly a lot of proof on his phone that he is connected. Of course, he's, he's connected. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not arguing against that. He's certainly connected, uh, but we must go through a proper investigation. We must go through a proper trial uh, to finally say that. 
Uh, but what I'm saying is uh, that he came into this because of President Yamin. Yamin inducted him into these wrongdoings. So he's a victim of persuasion? Yes, victim of persuasion or, or, or power is a rather odd thing. You can get all sorts of people to do anything when you are the president. Um, and I'm, I'm telling you after having been one. And President Yamin is in the business of bringing young, young people uh, uh, to uh, task him, uh, ta task them, them with things that he wants done. So as a president, do you think you've overstepped the mark with power then? I think uh, I would agree. How so? You know, after 30 years of single party rule, autocracy, you cannot, it's, it's possible to topple uh, a, a dictator, but it's not so easy to uproot a dictatorship. Um, in fact, we've never had multi-party government in the Maldives or multi-party politics in the Maldives or competitive politics in the Maldives. We are still very feudal. Uh, and therefore, to move from feudalism to pluralism overnight is not possible. So there have been instances, I'm sure if you go into my government and analyse that, you would see instances when uh, uh, the, the president, me, uh, having done or rather envisaged things that I shouldn't have. Anything spring to mind? I think one of the things was uh, 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 the schools um, and the health system, uh, especially uh, the powerhouses. Uh, you know, our islands have local small powerhouses. We have 196 islands. And we wanted to, uh, uh, in our government, we wanted to consolidate all these powerhouses into uh, a number of bigger uh, uh, companies. But these powerhouses were actually owned by islanders. Uh, and we, in fact, I think were too harsh in trying to get that back into a system. Um, our intentions were to get it back into a system, but what we had actually done was to confiscate someone else's property. It's very brave to admit your failings. Well. I, I suppose we have to move forward and we have to learn, um, learn from our mistakes uh, and I uh, uh, worry about these things um, and I, uh, I worry about how we governed uh, and therefore I sit down and think and try to come out with it. Now you've been shuttling from Sri Lanka to the UK where you live now. Has either of these countries provided you with any support for your cause? Well, England has uh, given me a ref safe refuge. Um, I have not uh, done any. I know that I have not done anything wrong in Sri Lanka in Sri Lankan law. So therefore, Sri Lanka being a free country, um, I can always go to Sri Lanka. Um, I am. I meet the president. I meet the prime minister. Um, I have known them before they became presidents and prime ministers, and before I became. A president. I used to work in Sri Lanka as a journalist in the 90s. Um, so I know the country and I know a number of people also in Sri Lanka. I know their society. Um, Sri Lankans are always helpful. Um, I have always been with the view that to stabilize the Indian Ocean, Sri Lanka must play a more robust role. Uh, and Sri Lanka is, in my view, they have 20 million people, they have 500,000 soldiers and a booming economy. They, they are 3%, I think, of the world trade. Um, and it's a good country to take more control. You've received support from Western human rights groups and the celebrity lawyer Amal Clooney. Now, some in South Asia are very wary of these groups, believing they have a geopolitical agenda. What do you say to those concerns? The pain is not a geopolitical agenda. Human rights is not. You feel pain, I feel pain. If you torture anyone, um, you will feel the pain. So I think it's very important uh, we try to eradicate um, human rights abuses and try to see that we get governance proper and correct. Um, I don't think and I do not believe that South Asians would mistake uh, me or our intentions. Um, I have uh, I've lived all my life almost all my life in South Asia. I am a South Asian and, and I believe that South Asian people 
are aware of our predicament and I believe that they are aware of what we are trying to do. Now the Maldives have always been a traditional but tolerant Islamic country, but that seems to be changing. Do you believe that's because of the influence of Saudi Wahhabism? The Saudis have propagated a very narrow version of Islam in the Maldives for the last 30 years, uh, more than that, last 30, 40 years. Uh, and therefore, um, the people of the Maldives um, have bought that. Uh, a fair amount of the people of Mo Maldives have prescribed to that view of Islam. Uh, that has also created a breeding ground for more radical Islam, um, the ISIS um, and other uh, um, jihadi groups. So I think, yes, um, this is very, very unfortunate uh, that this has happened and it's going on. But we must understand that any world movement, any Islamic movement anywhere is going to have an impact also in the Maldives as well. But we must be mindful of what's happening uh, and we must make sure that we protect and we have, we maintain our way of life. Uh, um, we were brought up as Muslims and we remain as Muslims and we remain as understanding Muslims, uh, not at odds with the rest of the world. The highest number of South Asian jihadists have come from the Maldives. Where is this radical Islam coming from? Well, from the propagation of this narrow, very narrow version of Islam uh, by the Saudis for the last 40 years. Uh, they have their imams, they have their mosques, and um, they are now wanting to change the school curriculum. Um, they want to tra apparently train our judiciary. Uh, uh, they want to apparently train our military. Uh, they apparently want to purchase an atoll. Uh, um, they of course do want to come to holiday uh, and they're very welcome to do that. Uh, but all the other uh, work that they've done in the last so many years, we are just waking up to it. It could be philanthropic motives. They could just want to help the Maldives. It could be, um, uh, uh, but unfortunately uh, the vested interest in it and the strategic agenda behind it is now becoming very obvious. And you think that's radical Islam? I think that's radical Islam and I think it's more than radical Islam. I think uh, what, what they would like to do is, they do know that uh, um, the West is not going to continue buying their oil and they do know that their biggest market would lie in Asia, in China. Uh, and therefore, you cannot cross the Indian Ocean without crossing the Maldives. Uh, uh, you can't take your oil uh, to China without crossing the Maldives. Uh, and therefore, Maldives becomes strategically important. It's of a strategic location that is our undoing. Uh, and, they have, and, and therefore, they have designs, uh, strategic designs on the Maldives. Now China is making strides in the Indian Ocean, they've bought an atoll and that has New Delhi worried. What do you think the Chinese strategy is? We've signed into uh, the Chinese Maritime Silk Route. President Yamin had signed into it. And again, they want to uh, safeguard and they want to own shipping routes and trade routes. And again, um, our strategic location means that therefore they, have, they must have clout in the Maldives. Um, they've already, as you mentioned, bought a number of islands um, and they are in the process of establishing strategic infrastructure on these islands. Uh, this is very, very unfortunate, uh, but this is happening at a rapid speed um, and therefore we must be very, very mindful of what's going on. If you do not have a stable Maldives, you will not have a stable Indian Ocean. Historically, this has always been true. Does China's desire to dominate the ocean worry you? It worries us, us extremely. We've been an independent country for the last uh, two, three thousand years. Um, and we, we have a language of our own. Uh, we have a written history that goes back 1,500 years. Uh, and we like to have control of our affairs. We like to be us. You think that China's influence, buying of islands, means that China plans to control the Maldives? Well, they, they, it's difficult to think how they could do anything else uh, other than control. Um, our, our biggest worry is that human rights is our biggest worry. Uh, and they are not concerned about democracy and governance. 
uh, and if they, if they have uh, similar views as we have, there's, there's no reason not to like the Chinese. The only, only, we do like the Chinese people. That's not the issue here. The issue is that they have a single party state and they want to impress their ideas, their views, their ways on us. Um, and we don't like that. Now, many people will remember your well-publicized underwater cabinet meeting to highlight the rising sea levels. Was that just a publicity stunt? Well, uh, our means, again, very, very modest. Uh, um, and we don't have a large amount of funds to do publicity work. Uh, but when we went to the 2009 Copenhagen summit, uh, we were with the view that the international community must understand uh, the gravity of the issue, uh, especially uh, with respect to low-lying islands. Um, and then we asked um, a publicity company uh, if they could do this. And they, 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 they quoted a huge figure, which we couldn't actually pay. So we thought, OK, maybe let's give it a shot ourselves. Um, so we came up with the idea of the underwater cabinet. Uh, the, the, the objective was to impress upon the international community the gravity of the issue. And I hope that we achieved, and I believe that we achieved that objective. How serious is climate change for the Maldives? Is it the most pressing issue? It is the most pressing issue. Uh, we will not be there. Uh, 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 sea levels will rise. Um, it's a done deal now. So we must go into more adaptation. Uh, we must find ways on how we may be able to survive after climate change. There's no reversing. There is no reversing in, uh, with respect to the Maldives. Uh, um, the, the, the planet is going to be heated by two degrees uh, because we already have 400 parts per million of carbon in our atmosphere. Um, and therefore, the planet is heating. And we can see that our coral is bleaching. The seas are rising. The, the um, glaciers are melting. Um, and we can see that. The science is sorted. It's very obvious. Uh, you can't cut a deal with physics. You can't negotiate with the laws of science. Uh, uh, and it's, it's madness to think that uh, we can actually find other solutions. No, we can't. Um, so, unfortunately, uh, we've come to this predicament, we've come to this difficulty, and now the only option available for us would be heavy adaptation. And even in adaptation, uh, my view is the most important adaptation measure is democracy and governance and human rights, protection of human rights. If, with, without that, you do the wrong revetments, you do the wrong uh, water breakers at the wrong places, you do everything wrong. Uh, so first is democracy, and, and then I think uh, perhaps we can go into better adaptation methods. Um, again, I would, I would seek more biological adaptation, natural adaptation, than more concrete adaptation. Were you then dismayed when you heard the American President Donald Trump say climate change isn't happening? Well, the American people would understand and would know. I do not think any politician can actually change these facts. You could say these things. I mean, I could say uh, there are people who still don't believe that man landed on moon. There are the people in the Maldives. People, I've, I've met many, many people in all sorts of places. But that doesn't mean that people did not go to the moon. Uh, again, the science is sorted. But he's not any man. This is the President of the United States. Does that not worry you? Well, we have to respect the decision of the people of the United States. They decided uh, to elect a president, as they always do. Um, and for all sorts of reasons, we ha now have a president that uh, 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 some of the liberal left m do not like. But uh, we've, we've seen many, many uh, Republican presidents uh, where we had so many reservations upon them, on them, but coming out at the end of the day looking like uh, having done good work. Uh, and I think I'll pro point out uh, President Reagan. So you have hope? Because I'm a centre-right politician. Have you met Prime Minister Modi? I have met Prime Minister Modi before uh, Prime Minister, before Modi became uh, Prime Minister. 
But as soon as um, uh, the elections happened, I was put to jail. And therefore, I did not have the opportunity to meet uh, him, uh, Modi, as prime minister. What do you make of him as a leader? I think he's an excellent leader. I, li I quite like the way that he, he's going about it. Uh, I think Indian development is so rapid and it is for the benefit of, the, of not just on the South Asia, but I think in my view for the rest of the world as well. Now, India has been providing financial aid to the Maldives, uh, supporting hospitals and even the army. Are you somewhat disappointed that democratic India is supporting the current government and not backing your cause? No. I'm not disappointed. I think India should always be engaged in the Maldives, whoever who is in government. Uh, and I think it would be highly irresponsible if the Indian government did not do that. Thank you very much.